and welcome back to Microsoft Mechanics Live. Coming up, we're going to take a look at how you can build a zero trust network. And our work till now in Microsoft 365, we're going to break this down to the core concepts of what is zero trust, how's Microsoft been delivering against that concept with Microsoft 365 and conditional access, and how built in intelligence from the cloud actually improves your ability to detect and respond to risks. And finally, how you can get on board fast with security baseline, something new as well as Secure Score, and much, much more. And for that, I'm joined by Alex Weinert as a lead engineer on the identity team at Microsoft. Right. Happy to be here. And you also cover things like the Xbox logins, consumer, commercial, all of it, right? Yeah, the identity security and protection team protects all accounts hosted by Microsoft, whether in a business, enterprise, or you know, anything from Xbox, Outlook, Skype, you have, you know, if you log into it, we protect it. All right, so we're hearing this, this term a lot, zero trust networks. For the folks that are new to that term, what does it actually mean? Um, I think the easiest way to think about it is if we can go back you know, 25 years to the walled garden approach, right? Right. where we thought, you know, if there's somebody on my network, they must be in the building, they must be on a device that I issued, you, know, you feel pretty good about that. Um, and as you look at the attacks that we have where attackers are able to get into networks within 24 hours, get domain admin in networks in 48 hours, stay resident in networks for 100 days, you know, that we see that that walled garden approach has some pretty serious flaws. And it kind of extended out to the concept of VPN as well, right? Right, well that's, I mean, that's the issue is that when you, know, you go, you start with a place where even if your network was what, what, sort of sacred at one time, as soon as you punch a VPN to that, you have connectivity to the outside world, right? Right. And um, so we see cases where either new vulnerabilities emerge and those VPNs can be attacked in that way, um, or just where you know, there's exceptions made. Right, and some of the things that we've seen in terms of uh, VPN vulnerabilities, what, what have you observed, I guess, in your years doing all the identity work at Microsoft in terms of some issues we've encountered over the years? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example based on a, one attack that we dealt with that was pretty severe. And the way it started was that um, you know, the VPN was set up in a pretty good way. Security team and the CISO specifically were very convinced they had a good thing going. Mm -hmm. um, they had an exec who uh, traveled to do some business meetings, right. and uh, that person lost their phone and had to get a new one, and that new device in a new country you know, was out there, but that person couldn't get the, the phone set up for that VPN from where they were, and they were insistent that they would be allowed to get onto the network. Okay. So they called, they yelled, right? people got scared, and yep. what happened was the, an exception was made. Right? Right. And so uh, at that point, the exec was happy, and the IT team was busy, and they kind of forgot about what they had done. Yep. And uh, this all came out in the course of the investigation that we did, that this was the history. Unfortunately for this company, the next step was, you know, the bad guys kind of figured out um, that this had happened, that this rule set had been allowed. And once they did that, they were able to exploit that same hole through the VPN by coming in, uh, you know, from a botnet node on that kind of device in that country. And then it was game over. Right, right. And it's right. sort of, we talk about, you know, it's the crunchy shell around the soft, chewy center. Like, the bad guys like to get into that soft, chewy center. When we think about zero trust, uh, you know, zero trust network, it's more like zero trust in the network, right? right? Um, you want to think about it as though every asset you have is available on the open internet, because they are. Yeah. Right? Well, that, that and even classically, when you think about networks, you're going to have different, different services, different ports that are open. For example, if you need to SSH into a resource or use RDP, RDP like SQL, these right. are some of the most common things. And the, the, the kind of ironic thing is, when you do move to the cloud, a lot of the attackers follow you. It's sure. kind of like the, the kind of organisms that kind of attach to other fish and stuff in the sea. They go back up with you into the cloud and they're looking for the same types of ports that are open. Right, and, and again, part of your problem here is if you make this assumption that, you know, once, once I have it on my network, it's fine, or I put a firewall around it and it's okay. Yep. The, the, the assumption has been proven over and over again to be false. And so whether it's through port scans of the type you're talking about, um, or it's through you know, exceptions of the type we talked about before, yep. you know, that, that's a fundamental flaw in your thinking. Yep. So, you know, be explicit about not, well, it must be okay to have this port open because it's on my network, mm -hmm. but what is the resource? Who should have access to it? When should they have access? You know, building a policy is the way to go. And the scary thing is once they do actually find that open port, do a brute force against it, then they can actually start to do things like move laterally <laughs> through your network. So, for example, on 1433, an old classic chestnut of a, of a SQL port kind of issue where a lot of times the admin creds aren't set up correctly for some of the critical accounts there, 
once you gain access to that server and you can actually open a command shell, you've got basically admin privs and you can start moving laterally through the network. Right, and, it's, and it is pretty amazing how effective people are doing that. And again, you know, expect that your attacker, once they're in your network, is a domain admin inside of 48 hours. Right, right, right. So we've had a long history then at Microsoft in terms of putting controls into place to start to prevent these types of uh, vulnerabilities effectively by applying the controls more internally, right? Right. Well, so we, you know, we started, you know, years ago with the sort of idea of assume breach, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, right away you're kind of okay. If somebody's already in the network. How do I set up policies and controls? But the other thing that we talked about is that, you know, it's a new world, right? Like if I look out here, most of the people in the audience have smartphones in their pockets and laptops right. in their bags, right? And and that world, and you're using the conference Wi-Fi. So how many networks have you been on today? How many devices have you been on today? How many apps have you used today? Yep. Right? The only thing that we can really pin policy around is the user. So that's the other thing that we've been saying for a while. Identity is the control plane. Mm -hmm. And within identity, conditional access is the policy language. Right? Okay. And so that's where we say, you know, that's really where it comes back down to conditional access. I think that as, as we get more focus on zero trust, which is great, um, the advantage we have at some level is that we have this you know, great group of people that are using it that are on this journey with us, and we learn from them, right? So we yeah. have right now, daily, we have 27 million users uh, under protection of conditional access per day, um, and we're seeing something like a 300% year-over-year growth in the adoption of it, right? right? All those customers, all those tenants are teaching us, right, what do they need, what are the things that we need to do? The other thing that's really significant is that we have all that signal, right? We understand what the threats are, what the attacks are, and we can see the policies that are effective and then help people use those policies. Right, so the real crux of this is there's no standing trust, there's no inherited trust. Zero trust is about really making sure every time a resource is accessed, we can assess how trustworthy that access is or that request is. So, right. So if you're new to CA, and I think a lot of people, it sounds like here are using it, What's an example of how you'd maybe use, start using it? How would um, we protect a risky login, for example? Yeah, so we want to be thinking in terms of continuous verification and re-verification of the elements of access, right? Okay. And really, in the terms of what makes sense for the business. So I'm going to give us some simple examples as we're kind of, you know, we've got a quick timeline. So I'm just in the Azure portal. I went to Azure Active Directory. And if you go down to security, uh, you'll see conditional access there. Okay. Okay. And we've set a few, a, a few policies up for this demo. For this example, I just want to do something real simple, which is we're going to MFA every access to SharePoint. Mm -hmm. So we're going to say, look, the friction is low. You know, you can go get to other resources. But we want to make sure there's a challenge on every access to SharePoint. Okay. And for those of you who aren't yet using conditional access, I, I understand many are. But um, you know, just basically, you have two elements. And it's very easy to think about. You have uh, what's under these assignments are what we call conditions. And conditions are the selectors for the policy. If these conditions are met, we're going to fire the policy. Right. right. So which users do you want? And the cool thing that we've added that I want to show off real quick is that we now allow you to assign conditional access policies by roles. So if you want to look at, you know, my exchange admin needs to be under a specific policy, mm -hmm. that's much, much easier to do. And the other thing that's cool and new is that, uh, you know, full support for B2B and making it really easy to say your business partners, you can assign policies for them as well. Okay. Okay, so um, here we've just selected my user as, a, as an example. And then for cloud apps, it's really important when we think about zero trust. If you imagine that your network is on the open internet, that means the apps in your network, you want to model them in the same way, mm -hmm. which means that every internal and external app, you want to have it under the management of conditional access. Right. So here, you know, we've got a set of uh, example applications. And you know, for SaaS apps, there's, I think, 3,000 now. So both that are Microsoft and also non-Microsoft apps. Oh, yeah, no, definitely, yeah, third-party SaaS as well as Microsoft SaaS apps, as right. well as your on-prem apps okay. using uh, the app proxy. So you can actually get all of your apps in that model. Very cool. And what that allows you to do is have a consistent policy language and consistent auditing, you know, consistent uh, security model for it mm -hmm. all. So, um, and then finally, we can look at things like, you know, what do we do when that policy matches? Okay. Right? And so here, you know, typically our model is in Azure Active Directory that you're going to say a user can access an app based on who they are. But what conditional access does, it says, if these conditions apply, let's make them do some extra stuff. Right. Right. So the extra stuff we're going to use in this example is multi-factor auth. We could instead do a TOU. We could challenge them, block them. There's new stuff we're doing all the time. And one of the cool side benefits here in terms of uh, MFA, it gives you basically that step up into a second factor of authentication if we detect something looks risky, for example. But 
It also will eliminate some prompts if we can say that something looks like it's not risky. So for example, if they're within an IP range that we know we trust it's our own set of IPs in a location that Alex is always logging in from, maybe your home, maybe the same device all the time, then we can actually start to reduce some of those second factor prompts, but still have the same security level, right? Right. And, and just to give you a sense, there's a ton of other conditions that we let you signal on. And sign in risk is just one of them. So it's super easy to set up. Mm -hmm. You just go in here, you click on sign in risk, and then pick the levels that you want to fire right. the policy on. Um, the other thing I want to show just briefly is that we don't stop right when you look at access. There's also the ability to instruct the system to do uh, downstream things. So in this example that we're about to show, we're going to talk about SharePoint actually taking additional decisions based on the conditions of the login. Okay. And the way that we do that is we can send a signal downstream that says, hey, look, I want to do some additional enforced, uh, app enforced restrictions, or what we call limited access mode. Okay. Um, and then conditional uh, access app control lets us in invoke Microsoft Cloud App Security, so you can get some really rich uh, you know, threat signal and auditing and that sort of thing there. So let's right. say you have a user who's at risk, they get a sketchy login, right? and, and maybe you want to, in this case, say, well, it's a low value resource, I want to see what that attacker is doing, mm -hmm. let's follow them. Right? Right. And so this gives you some really incredible power in terms of thinking about how you model this. Again, you're verifying everything, you're controlling everything. What does it look like then to go to the user experience? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, uh, you know, we've seen here that we've set up the policy that says we don't need MFA until we go to SharePoint. Yep. So just by way of example, if I go over here to Outlook, um, and the demo gods are smiling, here I am, right? And uh, I have, you know, my mail, no problem, right? Okay. If I go back and I go to SharePoint now, conditional access is going to be invoked at the point that we try to get that access, and um, we see that we get an interstitial here, which is I need to approve a sign-in request. Now, a okay. super cool thing we've been doing is the Authenticator app is the way to go, and we've just done an integration with the Apple Watch. So here I've just got to touch my wrist. I feel like Dick Tracy, right? And I've approved the sign-in request. Super, super easy. Um, so increasingly, these authentication gestures are getting really, really easy to get very, very strong off. If you're running Windows Hello, it's literally like look at your screen, right? right. Um, and so that's a really good way to go. And so now we're into SharePoint, mm -hmm. and I can see here that I've got some fun stuff and maybe scheduling a team lunch. Okay. Okay. If I zoom in on this, just trying to make it a little bit easier to see, you can see that this is classified in general. Right. And now these labels, these classifications are available to the, to the tenant to decide, you know, the customer can decide how these are set up. Okay. But because this is general, I just got right in, no problem, no restrictions, I can do whatever I want to do. If I were to go back to SharePoint now, this is some super cool work that we've uh, done in conjunction with the SharePoint team. When we go to this financial site, we can see that it's classified differently. And this is something customers have been asking us for, for a while. So this is classified confidential, yep. right? Because of the classification difference and the fact that we put it in limited access mode, we can now see that this uh, yellow bar has shown up, and it's basically saying your organization isn't going to let you download, print, or sync, yep. right? So we've yep. been able to put a restriction and say this content is too special to get on a computer that isn't being managed. So it's really cool, if, just to step back for a second. So even within the same browser session, you didn't need to reboot. Even while you're running, you can do some things to even d disable a session, for example. But here we saw that we had a step up auth, even though we were logged in the mail. Then when we actually were moving laterally through SharePoint, some of the sites are labeled and classified as such that you have a different experience from site to site. Right, and by, by putting these restrictions in place, you know, this capability lets you actually extend your horizon of productivity. Right. right. You're able to sort of think, all right, instead of saying nobody can get to this, it's just nobody can download here. But that means that if somebody has to work late, you know, you go home, you need to review a document, make some notes on a, say, a PowerPoint presentation, right? Yep. Then, um, then you can do that, it's just that you can't save it to your local drive. So that document remains protected, but the employee can still be productive, right? And that's what we're looking for. Constantly using good security to push out that horizon of productivity. True, true, very cool, very cool. All right, one more thing I would love to show you um, is, you know, there's other ways to think about this. And I want to talk briefly to blocking legacy off. So this yes. is another thing that we've added recently. And just to show you where to find it, in, uh, under the uh, cloud apps that you're using here, you can look into these conditions. And what we've done is we've said we want to look at what client apps we're using. And in this case, we're saying we don't want to let in any apps that are uh, in sort of the other category, which is to say legacy auth. So pop, IMAP, um, you know, XML auth, header-based auth, these things that are not going to allow us to do MFA challenges or to have a good session. Modern that we can authentication. Work. Right. <laughs> Most of our attackers are using tools built on these legacy auth protocols. Right, right. Right. And so what we found statistically is that if you turn on this policy, you will stop 66% of the compromises in your org. 
Wow. It's crazy. It's like I, I was very surprised that a it was couple, that strong. A couple of big percentages just to kind of back up. 66% blocked through not using those old legacy auth platforms. Also, 99.9% .9 effectiveness for MFA. Right. As we've heard this yeah, week, it's, it, it's in terms of blocking identity-based attacks. So, really, really big. Right, numbers. and it's all available to you now, right? right? If you, if you, you know, it's not hard to do. All right, so this is a beautiful looking app here. It looks, is it Pegasus Mail? Yeah, this is the, the latest, hottest Pegasus client. And the Luna, um, the Luna t theme that we rolled out with Windows XP, I think. Right. Looks really good. It's nice. And so what we did is we set this up earlier, and we've turned on this block like it's the auth protocol. And what you'll see is that it's very simple. That when conditional access sees that policy applying to me as a user, it's going to say, "Sorry." you don't get to log in, right? And so we've just stopped the use of that client altogether. So we've stopped all the, the vulnerabilities that come along with that protocol, right? Very cool, very cool. So at the protocol level, you can stop things at the site-to-site -site level. You can also do things in terms of making sure that users are, are off then in a, in a secure way. So we've shown a lot of stuff today, but what's actually available now and how should people get started? Well, almost, I mean, everything I've shown you, you can use either in preview or in GA. Most of the stuff is, has been generally available for a while. Okay. Um, like I say, we have millions of, of customers around the world using it every day. Yep. And uh, you know, we're, we're seeing real results in terms of security improvements. In fact, uh, we're moving more and more towards you know, codifying and saying, here's some policies that we're seeing be super effective. We take all that intelligence that my team gets from you know, it's like six and a half billion signals a day. Right. 40 terabytes of data a day go through our machine learning system alone. Yep. Um, the, the, the net of that is that we can do a lot to say, okay, these are the behaviors that result in compromise. These are the policies that can help you out. Right. So there's another thing I'd love to show you just uh, real quick about something we've been doing in that regard. Under the policies, there's another kind of policy that we've been working on kind of creating. Mm -hmm. So as we look at, you know, again, the usage of this, what makes people more secure, there's a set of pieces of guidance that we're trying to get out. Right. One of them is, please MFA your admins. Yep. Hey, this is crazy. Totally. Like, I have a, on my team, I have a group of investigators that we do first response to these major breaches. Yeah. And it's almost always like, yeah, your admin had password one, two, three, and no MFA, and, or, they got, or they got a keystroke logger, or they got phished. Right? And right. then no MFA, and it means the bad guy gets right in there. They own you at that point, right? Yep, yep. So this is a policy that, you know, as much as everything else is very rich, we're creating a set of kind of canned policies, like best practice policies, mm -hmm. and literally all you have to do is go turn it on. You say, use policy now, you're done. Very cool. Right? So that's a, that's a thing that we're really happy about. And then we're extending that a little bit farther in terms of that guidance and those best practices in terms of how to create a very secure environment in this zero trust mindset. And that is something called Secure Score. Okay. And Secure Score has been around for a while in Office. We made a massive investment in, it in Microsoft 365. And one of the things that's happened is that there's an identity specific place for the identity admin, there's a network specific place for the network admin, the infrastructure admin, and so forth. So the identity Secure Score is where you, as identity folks, can go and see okay, what are the things I can do that have the biggest impact in improving my security posture, and then build a plan around that. If you were to look at the top one on here, it says enable MFA for Azure AD privileged users, and it'll just loop us straight back. We see the quick explanation of what to do, and then we can go down here and say, let's get started. And when you get started, it'll take you right back to that baseline policy and turn it on. Yep, right? Go straight in. So that there's a whole new uh, kind of update that we're doing across the board for Secure Score that actually applies to all the other workloads as well as identity, like you see here. So, very, very cool stuff. Now, where would, you, where would you tell people to go in terms of getting started with maybe a website or, or maybe more information? Where's the best place there? Yeah, so um, go to aka.ms slash zero trust, and uh, there's a, a lot of content there about conditional access, and we'll continuously extend that and uh, have more content there for the zero trust framework and conditional access as well. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us today, Alex, and thank you for watching today and joining us in the audience. That's all the time we have for this show. Follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube. Bye for now.